I'm happy to be here to share some of the research that I've done um, so far. So I'm going to try to look at you here. There's an audience here, so I might be looking around um, just to sort of address you. So the title of my talk is Beyond the Randomized um, Trial to Prevent Vascular Events in HIV Reprieve, um, and then Cardiovascular Disease in Persons Living with HIV. Um, just my disclosures, I've served on the Scientific Advisory Board for Aviv, uh, as well as uh, Gilead. So I think um, for those folks who, you know, um, have been in the HIV uh, field for a long time, and I've come into it, but I've definitely had family members who've died of HIV or who were born with HIV um, and have lived with HIV. We What we do know with years of research is that our patients living with HIV are aging thanks to the advances that we've made in antiretroviral therapy, but they do they sure seem to have uh, some level of premature aging, even when you account for everything else. And this is a picture from the New York Times years back that talks about one John Holloway who's 59, but he has more health problems than his 84-year-old father. Um, so this is not new. And um, we tend to see that those age-related diseases are more common in persons who are living with HIV compared to persons without HIV. Uh, this include cardiovascular disease, diabetes, uh, non-AIDS cancer, osteo osteoporosis, and also in sort of in the neurocognitive realm. And so something definitely that uh, many of us are starting to pay attention to, while cure is still a goal for our patients, uh, until we get to cure is how do we get them to continue to have a good existence and to continue to um, not have to face um, uh, increased comorbidities. But then I think also, we know that a lot of these comorbidities are driven by the inflammatory system, by the immune system. And so I think our patients who live with HIV have, have actually always been involved in research. And I think there's a lot that we can learn for, from them that also will help the general population. So in the next one hour, um, I'm going to talk about two cases that are uh, cardiovascular disease related. I'll talk about heart disease in persons with HIV, just mentioning a few uh, pivotal studies that we've learned from that are sort of the reason why we focus on the role of the immune system and then talk about reprieve and why this has actually changed how I am practicing medicine in clinic with my patients or how I'm talking about cardiovascular risk. And then uh, this will set, set me up to talk about some of the research that we're doing, uh, which is looking at inflammation within aorta and coronary arteries, trying to understand what's happening at the tissue level because we know that what's happening in the blood is not necessarily what's happening at the tissue level. And then a little bit about future directions. And then obviously, I think at the end of the day, it's all about our patients that we're interested in. So this ones are actually from the New England Journal of Medicine that were published uh, from Reprieve. The first patient is a 63-year-old male. He was diagnosed with HIV in 1993. He had Kaposi sarcoma, which means that he CD4 count was really low. Um, and uh, probably had, you know, he had AIDS. Uh, he was started on antiretroviral therapy in 1995, which is remarkable that he uh, was able to sustain that. Um, he had his first myocardial infarction at the age of 39 in 1999. Um, he was started on statin therapy. He had a second myocardial infarction in 2012. When they do a cardiac cath, he has significant disease burden. Um, his heart function is not great. His EF was 35. Um, he also has atrial fibrillation. And in addition to ART, which is now one pill, he has so many other medications for uh, heart disease, which includes a statin. So we'll call him patient R. And our second case is a female patient. She's 51 years old. She was diagnosed with HIV in 2001. And she's actually a long-term non-progressor. So for 10 years, um, she was able to uh, not be on, on ART. And she actually was started on ART in 2011 before we were requiring it to be started because she requested it. She has no comorbidities um, and she's doing well on antiretroviral therapy. Our patients are diverse. A lot of how disease manifests is also influenced by genetics and other traditional risk factors. So this captures that really nicely because when you're in clinic and you're deciding who do I give a statin or who do I not, who's at risk of having a heart attack or cancer, those are things that we sort of need to pay attention to. 
But when it comes to cardiovascular disease risk, we know that our patients have a, a, a about twofold high, uh, twofold increased risk of developing cardiovascular disease when you compare to the general population. And so from this study, which is published in circulation, cited several times, and I like it because it nicely shows from looking at the pooled risk ratio, and I don't know, let me get rid of this. Uh, okay, good. I think. Okay, I cannot get rid of it there, but you can see the title. So when you think about the pooled risk ratio of cardiovascular disease and people, thank you, um, living with HIV, um, we can look at cardiovascular events and um, compared to HIV negative individuals, yeah, you can sort of see the increased risk ratio um, that's depicted here. Uh, when you look at myocardial infections as well as stroke, um, in general, when you account for different events um, and look at the risk ratio, it's about this is sort of where the number that people cite comes from. So, sort of from some of these accumulated studies where the risk is about twofold, uh, slightly higher than twofold. Uh, of course, give or take their differences in different cohorts. Um, the Tryon study, which was published in 2009, actually, I think, nicely showed that if you look at heart attack rates in people who are living with HIV, from a very tender age of 18 to 34, and this does not even account for patients who have vertical transmission, what you can appreciate is that all, whatever age group you have, if, I mean, if a person has, if one of our patients has HIV, they have a higher risk of getting a heart attack or the, the rates of heart attack per thousand years are significantly higher. Um, across all age groups, it starts to teeter off as you get to 75 to 84, but it's still there. And the question could be, is it because our patients just have a higher uh, traditional risk? Are they smoking more? Take your pick, which one of this could it be? But it's none of them. So it's even though, even though, sure, we might have a little bit more smoking and maybe they're using uh, this substance use. Uh, maybe we have a little bit more obesity. And now with some of the new antiretroviral therapies, even when you take in th that into account, that's not enough to say why our patients or to explain why our patients have a close to two uh, fold increased risk. Um, in this paper that was actually published in 2019, what you can appreciate here is that the traditional risk factors are still important. So we're telling our patients, we need to treat your hypertension, try to eat foods that are low in salt, try to exercise, we're treating their diabetes because those factors are also important. But HIV itself is associated with elevated uh, cardiovascular risk in addition to all the other risk factors. Uh, this is from the DAD cohort as well, just showing um, some of the other factors. And of course, I think with some of the older antiretroviral regimens, exposure to PIs um, was also an important factor. Um, and then, you know, um, the hyperlipidemia, and especially with some of those PIs, that was also a risk factor. But I think this in this study that was done by uh, Matt Freiburg through the VAX cohort, <laughs> What they did show is that infection with HIV was associated with a 50% increased risk of uh, acute myocardial infection beyond that was what was explained by the Framingham risk factor and substance abuse. So if you if if one has HIV and the reference being uninfected, uh, what you can appreciate here, um, if you have a viral RNA greater than um, if you have detectable virus in here, they use greater than 500. Uh, their hazard ratio is higher, and then those who have a CD4 T cell count that's less than 200, uh, same thing, and that was actually significant. So you have persistent risk in individuals who uh, have higher HIV RNA, and that usually goes along with having a lower CD4 T cell count. So the conceptual framework like that we like to think about is, you know, there's biological factors, so the, the what you inherit from your parents, the genetics, and then you also have environmental factors and uh, and in addition to sort of polypharm polypharmacy and uh, healthcare disparities, all those other factors. But HIV, we think that is accelerating aging and is manifesting as different things, including increased cardiovascular risk. In the past, there were some guidelines that came up to have sort of what do you do about this? You know, you have patients who are living with HIV and um, you sort of put them in a certain age group. And, you know, when you take into account their age or whether or not they have diabetes, uh, you could sort of have those who are certainly at high risk, and even when you calculate the ACVD risk score, that they they seem to be a high risk. It was easy to say, sure, for those patients, go ahead and optimize lifestyle, but put them on a lipid. But for many patients, it wasn't really clear what to do about them and how to sort of consider them high risk. I certainly struggled with 
you know, talking to a patient about they have to take HIV medications, maybe they're taking a multivitamin, how to tell them that they need to take a statin when we really did not have guidelines for to do that. Well, the whole field was struggling with that, not just a few of us in clinic. And so this was a really clever study by ACTG with all the evidence um, that had been mounting, led by Stephen Greenspoon um, and the, a lot of the reprieve investigators, where they did a random, they proposed and actually carried out this randomized trial to prevent vascular events and HIV, which is where the title of my talk comes from, uh, which is abbreviated as reprieve. And so what they did is, um, they recruited participants and they tried to recruit them globally. I know when you talk to participants from, you know, other parts of the world, they still feel like we did not involve enough folks from Africa or Asia. However, this was the largest attempt to actually have a nice diverse population of individuals. Um, I did include here UCSD to show that this was also one of the recruiting sites um, that was included in the reprieve study. Vanderbilt was as well. But um, they, what they said is, um, can we reduce risk for cardiovascular disease with statins, but we're going to recruit individuals who have HIV, but do not have, so they could not have subclinical atherosclerosis or obvious cardiovascular risk. So starting with that, and then their goal was to follow them over a period of eight years and see whether you would have more events that are associated with cardiovascular disease in the in the in the placebo group group compared to the statin group, so they recruited about seven thousand seven hundred individuals. They were asymptomatic. They were on antiretroviral therapy, and their ACVD risk score was less than fifteen percent. Just using the hypertension, whatever we usually put in that score, and then when you compare placebo, they used pitavastatin, which was a drug that. They were able to use because it has less likely to have a lot of uh, adverse effects with other retroviral therapy, antiretroviral therapy uh, patients are on. And then the, the primary endpoints were um, the uh, major uh, adverse cardiovascular events. So cardiovascular death, myocardial infarction, uh, PAD, stroke, and all of that. Um, and then they also had secondary endpoints. And they were going to do this study for eight years. However, the study was stopped at five years because they actually showed that compared to placebo, pitavastatin was actually associated with a 35% reduction in major advanced cardiovascular events uh, with event rates of 7.32 and 4.81 per 1,000 people respectively. And I think you sort of you can appreciate that here uh, when, uh... oh, thank you. Perfect. Yeah, so this study actually did has yeah, has really informed us quite a bit in how it uh you know what and what I'm doing in clinic and I'll talk about that quite a bit. So but so you can see that here uh it was it was really clear that giving patients statins made a huge difference and for that reason that study was actually stopped at 5 years so that folks who are um, on the placebo group could have a chance to be put on statins uh, based on new guidelines that actually came out. And uh, this was actually just printed as a correspondence by Stephen Greenspoon on May 2nd in the England Journal of Medicine, where um, they've looked at more participants and looked at, and, and it still holds, uh, where you have a 7.77 uh, event rates in the placebo group compared to 4.9 per 1,000 people events. Um, so, you know, I, I know that we wanted a little bit more diversity in terms of the other parts of the world, but um, this has this has changed potentially what we're doing, not potentially what we're doing in clinic, and I'll talk about it in the next few slides. Um, there are other though, there's a lot that we're going to learn from Reprieve though, in addition to the fact that for the primary events, we're seeing a difference. The question is mechanistically, what is actually happening? How are these biomarkers changing? And from a cardiovascular disease endpoint, um, what are we seeing in terms of differences in plaque presence, coronary artery calcium, um, as well as just the vulnerable plaque, plaque burden in patients who are on statin therapy compared to those who were on placebo-based uh, therapy? So there's more to come on that. Uh, and I just put this here because this is sort of uh, setting us up for what's to come from this study. And I think soon enough, they're going to ask individuals who are interested in actually accessing this uh, studies. They'll be able to do that. So these are the new guidelines that actually came out, and I put that as a clinical pearl for anybody who actually sees patients. So these are recommendations for the use of statin therapy as primary prevention, 
of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease in people living with HIV. So as of February 27, 2024, they recommend that if you have persons living with HIV who have low to intermediate risk, so you put all these numbers that include the high blood pressure, if they're on blood pressure medication, um, also their LDL, their cholesterol levels, when you put all of that, um, if they have a risk of less than 20%, um, if they're aged 40 to 75, these are the individuals who are actually included in the study. Unfortunately, we don't have anything for individuals less than 40 years old. Then if the risk is five to 20, to less than 20%, they should be on a statin, right? So typically we wouldn't really know what to do, but we're having conversations and we're telling our patients, this is the differences. I would be on a statin. And in terms of tolerance, patients tolerated this really well. So we didn't have a lot of people who had muscle pain. And so the whole, and, and, and we even are telling people, these are the statins you can put patients on. And I'll share that a little bit more. So if you are HIV positive or a person who's living with HIV and your age is 40 to 75 years old, even though the risk score is five to less than 20%, based on reprieve, I would put my patients and I'm putting my patients on a statin. Um, when the risk score is less than 5%, so they uh, actually recommend uh, still uh, at least a moderate intensi intense intensity statin therapy. Here they ask patients and physicians to have a conversation. And sometimes people don't want to be on an extra pill. Um, but, you know, at some point we used to, you know, I've had some doctors say statins should be in water in one way or another just because they have so many benefits. Um, I think I'm having conversations with my patients and if they can tolerate it, I am putting them on a statin therapy. But definitely, if they're um, if they're five to twenty percent, I'm driving the conversation. If they're less than that, you know, we're having them. It's a joint conversation. If they're less than forty, we don't have any guidelines. But more more than that, now we actually have a, a table for what statins patients can be on. And I don't include the data here for each antiretroviral therapy that our patients can be on. They actually have recommendations for what statin to put patients on. So primary care providers, cardiologists, uh, folks in the community who are not necessarily in HIV care centers can also do that and be confident that their patients will do well. And um, there are options there so that, you know, the muscle pain is not as much of an issue. Okay, yeah, I actually did include it. So for each of the different drugs, um, the dosing is actually recommended and uh, which air um, and, and the statin that could be given. And so statins are great. I think um, there's still a lot that we need to learn about them, but in addition to actually reducing cholesterol, which you know is directly linked to plaque buildup and plaque progression, we do know that there are several anti-inflammatory effects that statins have, uh, in addition to direct effects on endothelial cells or immune cells. Um, and so knowing this, there's probably a lot more than just reduction of cholesterol levels because that was not directly linked. And so that leaves room for uh, a lot more to do. And so I, this statement was actually published recently, which says intensive studying therapy, which is a first line treatment to prevent cardiovascular events while effective in reducing morbidity and mortality has not reduced the overall prevalence of cardiovascular disease. So this is great that we have this and that we see that our patients uh, in, in, in the eight year period of time, were able to see that fewer MACE events, but we know that there's still a, we still have work to do with regards to our patients because we know that inflammation is a ma major driver. Um, and uh, let's see, oh good, okay, came off. Was that a question? An out <laughs> I can address that because I don't have- I think they, uh, someone is asking if they can get a copy of the slides. Yes. Um, and I think it's being recorded too. Yes, and it's being recorded. Perfect. Thank yes. you for joining. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, so here, um, so one of the study in this study they looked at um, uh, inflammatory markers, right? So what I, I I'll walk you through this just so that to so show you the difference. Um, in individuals who are on statin compared to placebo, you can appreciate that. Um, the lipoprotein PLA2 was significantly reduced. So was ox LDL. Um, HSCRP is a marker that we link with inflammation. That was also reduced. So that's fantastic. And it's a measure many people look at. But what I want to point you to is a lot of the inflammatory immune markers that we see that we think are important, those were not reduced, right? So what is the mechanism here? Cholesterol was reduced, but 
there's still work to be done because other markers that we know drive inflammation and drive di disease, exactly, can, CMV could be the reason, are not reduced. So this, I think this was one of the interesting things. And so this brings me to sort of bring up what is residual cardiovascular risk that persists after optimal management of traditional risk factors. So you're a cardiologist or your primary care doctor or you're an HIV care provider. Your patient has cardiovascular disease risk. You put them on a high intensive intensity statin therapy. And in general, what we're saying is many people respond and they have LDL is below 100. And they say they're taking their medications that's great if it's below 100. The individuals who, despite taking statin therapy, they still have LDL greater than 100, which could still mean that they still have residual cholesterol risk. Um, if they have inflammation still greater than two, which is HSCRP, but in this case, other immune markers that might be higher, then they have residual inflammatory risk. The folks who have residual thrombotic risk, we actually don't even have a good marker. Um, and then this residual triglyceride risk, our patients tend to have really high triglycerides. We've done lipidomics in aorta. Our patients always have higher triglycerides compared to those who are who, who do not have HIV. So that's actually a factor. And then lipoprotein A is also a factor. So based on this, um, you know, some of the work that we're doing is actually trying to understand what is actually going on in the artery that can help us understand mechanisms and can help us um, either at, a, at an individual level or population level make a difference in how we're caring for our patients and uh, and and in what to look for in some of the studies that we're looking at. Um, so we know that our patients have chronic systemic inflammation. So in many cohorts, if you take a person who's living with HIV and put them on antiretroviral therapy and look at a number of them, if you compare inflammatory markers in, uh, in, 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 in our patients and patients who are H or living without HIV, all, everything else being generally equal. So they're about the same age, they have diabetes or not, everything else being matched, they tend to have quite a little bit, they tend to have more inflammation even when they're on antiretroviral therapy and they're undetectable. And so the immune system is great. It helps to fight infection, but we do know that immune cells also drive other things. And today we're talking about cardiovascular disease, which is why I show this. So within coronary arteries, years and years of research by Peter Libby and others have shown that you can actually detect immune cells within coronary arteries. They're going there because you have plaque buildup to try to have regression of that plaque. Um, but in the process of doing that, you actually end up in some individuals with vulnerable plaque. Um, and even before getting the ability potentially to look at, see what's happening at the tissue level, um, studies have used PET-CT to just show this whole concept of if you have uh, HIV negative individuals or people without HIV and have participants with HIV and do a PET-CT, uh, you can appreciate better here in the axial view that you have much more inflammation uh, uptake here compared to the HIV negative individual. And um, this is in a number of participants. And in the same study, there was a correlation between the inflammation measured in, their, in, the, in the order and soluble CD163. Soluble CD163 is one of the biomarkers that's associated, associated with inflammation in uh, cohorts with HIV. Uh, it tends to be associated with uh, other markers of subclinical atherosclerosis. So here, it was actually interesting to see that it was associated also with inflammation that was seen within the plaque. Um, in other studies, this was actually done in Denmark. They had 26 individuals. They actually did not see the difference. In both of these studies, um, the individuals had known CVD, had no known CVD, actually. They excluded those um, why they didn't see a difference in this Denmark cohort is maybe how the, the CTs were done, um, but they showed no evidence of increased inflammation. This was a cohort of 26 people. This other one was done um, in the US. That being said, I think we still need a little bit more information. More studies have come up since then where we know that there's more inflammation in the, in the coronary arteries as well. The question is why? And is that something that we have to target beyond just using statins um, and using anti-inflammatories? So in my lab, um, this is what we've done. Uh, we've decided to do actually 
uh, we work with patients samples um, and uh, read out whether or not they have subclinical atherosclerosis based on CT images. Uh, but then we're also doing um, single cell transcriptomics um, as well as spatial transcriptomics, getting the tissue and saying, can we compare um, coronary arteries and aorta from people who are living with HIV? And can we understand what's happening at the tissue level to, to be able to, to inform whether we should use anti IL-1 kind of chemomab or should we actually target chemokines and in which type of individuals and how does that translate to things that we can actually measure in blood because we cannot always get access to tissue. Uh, and then ultimately the population level health is important. So going back and looking at SNPs and seeing whether um, we can understand this at a, at, at a population level. <clears throat> so to start with, we have three different cohorts that I'll mention. I'll show some data from a few cohorts. Um, also, just to give time for any questions and discussion at the end, so I don't want to go for the whole one hour. Uh, but to start with, we we obtained samples from CVPath Institute. So uh, they're based in Maryland. They this is Dr. Alokfin is a cardiologist. He runs it. Uh, Renuva Mani is actually his mom, but she's a pathologist and she's a cardio yeah she's a, a cardiovascular pathologist. So it's really it's really cool. So they get hearts. And they um, so they have a biobank and a repository of hearts. They've actually characterized the coronary arteries or they have the ability to. So it was a great partnership because I did not need a pathologist who could tell me whether this was an early or late atheroma. And, um, and then they were able to match them well. So they went into their biobank. They're since not collecting anything from HIV positive individuals or persons living with HIV. Um, so they... Uh, they <clears throat> they were able to get 13 samples um, and then match them to 13 persons who are living without HIV. And in general, we try to match them based on their death category, their age, their race, their um, sex, um, as well as uh, the plaque type. And um, and then and, and I'll go through some of the other cohorts that we have. So that's the first cohort that we have. The second cohort that we have actually is through the NIH. Um, and for that cohort, we were actually able to get aorta samples. And uh, so far, we've only been able to collect six because it's a prospective cohort. So as patients die, they send us the samples. And then we try to have persons who are uh, living without HIV as negative control. So for this, it's sort of, we sort of, it's, it's their convenience samples. We get what we can get. Um, and we started off by getting aorta samples. And then I put this here because I'm really excited to start working with this and get the data out here. So the last gift cohort, um, we're also working with, with Sarah and Antoine and Magali. And um, we're, um, we're gonna be looking at, um, we have aorta samples. We also have abdominal uh, adipose tissue, yeah. pericardial adipose tissue and subcutaneous adipose tissue. And we're planning to actually use this frozen tissues to do 10X flex single cell sequencing. Um, as well as from the same tissue, um, uh, extract RNA and DNA and be, do tissue metabolomics and lipidomics. Again, it's sort of a deep dive to what is the landscape, both immune-wise and metabolically, that's defining disease um, at this level. So for some of the data that we've collected, this is from the very first cohort uh, that was done by CVPath Institute. So we have HIV negative and positive individuals um, and um, and we compared the plaque area and also the, the percent stenosis. They were well matched. So there's really no difference. And I wouldn't want there to be a difference at this level because um, uh, we, we tried to match them based on the plaque type. So if it's an early atheroma, uh, it's more likely to have less plaque area and less stenosis compared to a late plaque. Um, and then at the very beginning, we actually used droplet digital PCR um, that um, Sarah uses a lot here for folks who are familiar with it to see if we could quantify um, HIV in the coronary arteries. So just to explain what we did, because at this point, this is a biobank that only has FFPE samples. So they shaved and they wouldn't share the blocks with us. So they shaved off the, um, the FFPE samples and then extracted DNA for us. And then actually we extracted the DNA and then that's what we used. So we wanted to be able to detect a single copy of HIV per cell, and we were able to do that. So this is ACH2 cells uh, as a control. I am showing you here in a few samples from all of the ones we did. And for each sample, we try to do it in triplicate or 
uh, to do multiple of them that we were able to detect. Uh, this is just showing you um, the HIV positive, HIV negative, the total cells. This is RNSP. Um, and so in all of the samples, we were able to detect HIV in 10 out of 13 individuals uh, from persons who are living with HIV. And in the HIV negative, we did not detect any HIV. Um, and then when we compared whether there was a difference if you had early or late atheroma, what we actually found is that there was more HIV in the late fibroatheroma compared to the early fibroatheroma, which is interesting. Even for the 13 samples that we had, we were able to detect that difference. But at the very beginning when we're presenting this data, everybody said, well, that's kind of cute, but RNA is what's important. So have you seen a difference in RNA? And so then we used RNA scope um, to try to say, well, in these samples, and if you, so it's it's been a little bit tough working with coronary arteries because they're not really well vascularized. A lot of activity tends to be in the adventitia. Um, and then depending on how the samples, if they're autopsy samples, how they were processed, if the RNA quality is not as great, then you might not see, not because it's not there, but because, you know, it took 36 hours before they processed the sample. So we, with all of that in mind, we went, we asked, can, can we actually find HIV? And the top is the HIV negative control, the bottom as a person's living with HIV. And you can see we were able to detect HIV mostly in the adventitia. Um, with the fluorescent approach, we were able to detect HIV in one out of six samples from this biobank. Um, and that's that one. Um, so, you know, that's all great. And, and I'll, I'll show you some of the correlation. I actually think it's it's been great data, but then we moved beyond that. And now this is from the second cohort where we were able to get aorta. And so with the aorta samples, um, we asked similar questions. So these are larger arteries. They still do form uh, fibro, the uh, atheroma, the important in uh, peripheral artery disease as well. And we asked, can we actually detect um, HIV with a protein assay and then also with an RNA assay, because for NDRI, these are individuals that we know died within 24 hours of us actually looking at this sample. So this is what we did. And here, um, what you can sort of see when I look at it here, this is compared to the HIV negative with the HIV positive here, the P24 staining, um, this is what we're calling positive, right? But it's really, in this individual, I couldn't even tell you what's positive. It's a limitation of the assay uh, because in tissue where you have quite a bit of cell death, sometimes you're not quite sure, is this actually what I'm looking for? Is this mm -hmm. non-specific? So that's one of the disadvantages of that. But we went ahead and actually, because for these samples, we had fresh tissue, we extracted RNA and we did RNA DDPCR, which is just sort of like RT-PCR, but we take advantage so you can see the drops. Um, and what you can appreciate here is that in the five individuals with HIV, we were able to detect HIV RNA in all of them. Out of all of this five, I quickly went through the metadata, but this uh, 5196, actually, we know that they had been undetectable for years. Their CD4 count was 400, and we can still detect HIV. The last gift cohort, because of all the metadata that's us, that we have from these patients, will allow us to answer the reviewers who keep coming back and saying, well, that, you know, sure, maybe they were not on treatment is why you can detect it and not because that potentially is driving disease there. Um, <clears throat> This is just, again, looking at it with uh, um, confocal microscopy where we were able to detect it here. Uh, we have also done uh, transmission electron microscopy and right here. So the HIV is the 6.27, uh, CD3 marker is 11.8, and then uh, the 17.9 here, this is a marker of um, uh, CD14 cells. So it would be nice if we had better resolution with this TEM, again, because all we had was FFPE blocks for these and we had not fixed it in tissue for electron microscopy, but we were still able to detect it that way in a way that, you know, we can sort of start to think that maybe where we're seeing these cells is in CD4 cells, it, but it certainly could be in monocytes. Um, so this, we're now using chromogenic uh, RNA fish again. So we, this is now we're able to do this in the samples that we got over a short period of time. And what you can appreciate here, um, and this is in the perivascular tissue and we captured within the adipose, is that we're able to see um, HIV positivity. And now we're combining this with CD163, CD4 uh, stain to see whether or not it's in T cells or macrophages or even monocytes. So um, I think 
the question we're trying to ask is, is HIV present within the coronary arteries? The answer is yes. Now, I don't show you the CMV data because there's really no difference between CMV by HIV positivity. We detect it. We don't detect it with all the markers as easily as we detect HIV with LTR. Um, I don't think we're having as much HIV rep of CMV replicating in the coronary arteries. So, you know, I think um, we recently tried to get this submitted to circulation research just to show that the virus is there. That was not enticing mm -hmm. enough. The question they said, is this related to inflammation? And the answer is yes. So here I just show you so that you can appreciate when you look at all the individuals and here I look at CD68 and I put granzyme B because it doesn't make sense to me. Maybe it makes sense to somebody else. There's a negative correlation with granzyme B here, uh, but certainly uh, compared to, we see a positive correlation. So the X axis is HIV copies and the Y axis is CD68 up here or granzyme B. Now I do adjust for plaque type because I did say that um, you know, in, in later atheroma, you see more HIV. And what I hope you can appreciate here is that um, you have a strong correlation between uh, HIV copies here and CD68. Um, and as, and, and also, sorry? Can you, sorry? Button. Can you okay. hear me? Oh, so they're talking to themselves. Okay. Um, and then also CD8. So we see a strong correlation between those and CD3. Interestingly, not maybe not unexpected, there's a negative correlation with CD25. Um, you know, CMV, again, so here, I don't know what to make of this and if because we sort of, it's sporadic, not every patient has detectable CMV by UL44, US28. So we're not gonna make a big deal about it. What potentially is interesting, so CHIP here is clonal hematopoiesis of indeterminate potential. We, we actually look to see if any of these individuals had CHIP just in within the tissue. And it looks like viral IL-10 might be related to clonal hematopoiesis. So that actually potentially is interesting. Um, whether or not we'll keep it for the paper, we don't know. Uh, but I think beyond looking at what is usually limited by immunohistochemistry, we're actually able to look spatially and see what's going on differently. So for folks who are not uh, familiar with spatial transcriptomics, there are two different platforms. And so what you do is you say, can I actually look and see uh, whether transcriptionally or even based on protein expression, the differences, and you can pick the region of interest. And, and in, ideally, we wanted to pick areas where you detected HIV compared to areas where you did not detect HIV. But just to, to sort of start us off, uh, we said, you know, if we were to compare coronary arteries that are otherwise well matched, and we use markers such as CD3, CD8, CD68 to pick the areas of inflammation, can we detect differences by HIV status? Uh, what I hope you can appreciate here is just sort of, again, this was within the atheroma, this is perivascular adipose tissue. In some areas you have a, a good mix of immune cells in other areas, not as much. Um, and we've used two different platforms here. And just for the sake of time, I don't put all of that data. Visium is another platform. So, and I'm happy to answer a little bit of questions about this, but nanostring is the top, Visium is the bottom. <clears throat> what I hope you can appreciate is that there's many more markers of inflammation that you can see with the, uh, the coronary arteries. And actually this is aorta from persons who are living with HIV. Um, and one of the interesting ones, which I wanted to sort of highlight today was CXCL12, which I would never have paid attention to, for example. Um, there are others that come up that here we just showed the top 20 um, from both. And somebody asked me, well, why does this not look red? It's, be it's because there was not as many here, right? I think you can appreciate that. So that's why this is not as significant. Um, but some of the pathways that came up that were significant and enriched were cellular senescence uh, with HIV, HIV infection, CMV infection, some of the genes that come up with that um, that were increased with the HIV samples. But CXCL12, potentially is one interesting one to sort of look into um, when we're thinking about beyond statins, what can we target? Because it's actually been shown to promote atherosclerosis because it downregulates this cholesterol transporter and then leads to the sort of uh, progression of atherosclerotic plaque. Um, and so this is a paper that nicely shows that. And there are several SNPs that have been associated with that that have been published that I've pulled up. But we went back to our data to say, hey, do we see a difference in some of these genes because we saw an increase in CXCL12? And the answer is yes. So in our persons living with HIV, and here this is uh, four different uh, HIV positive and negative individuals, 
they have reduced ABCA1. And an interesting fact is if HIV itself, NEF actually also downregulates uh, ABCA1 because it wants the cell to maintain cholesterol because it needs that cholesterol to bud off and infect other cells. So there's pressure for the virus to want ABCA1 to be decreased, but then also from a plaque progression standpoint, that could be important. And we see a similar effect on TCF21, which is increased um, in the same direction. So it looks like it's actually valid. Well, we've got on on to look for protein expression and we see a similar difference. There's a nice negative correlation between this. Uh, this is sort of the normalized expression. So what we're doing now is trying to see if we can replicate this ex vivo and show that this is indeed what's happening. Uh, but you can sort of see how in general, this is what will happen. But with HIV, um, you know, you have blocking of that. And in some ways, it could be one way that you have plaque progression in our patients with HIV. And just sort of to end it, you know, I think what can we target for our patients? I think there's so many different things, but if we can actually understand what's happening at the disease level, then I think we can potentially target pathways that have less adverse side effects, like increased infections with IL-1. If truly there are other pathways that are less, um, have less off-target effects, but can actually decrease progression without uh, affecting our uh, patient's ability to, to do that. So what have I told you? Um, that our patients have an increased risk of cardiovascular disease. If you didn't remember anything from today, that statin therapy is actually advice for our patients. But in spite of statins, more work needs to be done because there's still residual inflammation, and, and in, especially in our patients. And what we think is HIV persistence within the space is potentially important. Um, and if we can define new molecular targets, we can help improve outcomes for our patients and, and, and even for the general population, uh, because ultimately it's our patients who matter the most. And with that, I will say thank you for your attention and take any questions.